if you're into history, battlefields, stuff in the 1800s, today's gonna be a great video because <laughs> this, I love this kind of stuff. Super excited to be where we're at. Uh, we are within like 15 minutes of the Little Bighorn Battlefield. Actually, we are within 15 feet <laughs> of Little Bighorn River. So pretty awesome that we could just park our RV without the lid next to the Bighorn River. Not only is this a cool piece of history, uh, we've gone to sleep with the sound of this next to us. There's this area right here that's not as fast as far as current, and we're down here watching, and Hensley can play down here with us. This whole area is just beautiful. Kind of in a Badlands-ish kind of area. But this is the same river that was uh, in between Custer and uh, the Native Americans in the Battle of Little Bighorn. You know, that didn't happen in this exact spot, but it's still pretty cool to think that we can park our RV and stay for free next to the same river just down the road of where a lot of that stuff happened with that battle. Is that Manta Ray driving a police motorcycle? Can he do that? Yes. How old is he? Um, he's 25 years. Oh, well, okay, he's 25. I thought he was 13. I didn't know how he was doing that. He's how old is the penguin? How old is the penguin? 25 and 6'7. 25 and 6'7. So he's 2,567 years old. Okay. Well, we'll work on that. I've been working on uh, numbers and ages and how old are you and that kind of stuff with her. We're not technically homeschooling yet, but we're kind of already homeschooling. I don't know. It just kind of, kind of happens when you're on the road, I guess. And it's also crazy to see how much you can learn about your kid in an early stage. We did not teach her to organize her toys like this. She loves lining up toys and organizing things. I wonder where she gets that from. I don't know. <laughs> not me. <laughs> So we went to the visitor center first, kind of got our bearings, and uh, it's way more crowded than I thought it'd be here today. Yeah, I did not expect this. <laughs> like the whole area is kind of barren, but then you show up here and it's it's booming. This is one of the most well-known battlefields in the United States. If you're into battlefields, I mean, this is definitely one of the ones you well, want to check out. Well, we ran into a lot of them out east. Yeah, yeah, you get into yeah. Gettysburg and all that kind of area. There's a lot out there too. So this is our first out west one. So when you first pull up to the visitor center, you'll see the cemetery here. And similar to Arlington Cemetery, this is a place where loved ones can bury uh, people who were in battle and their family uh, with different wars, anything like the Spanish-American and World War I and all the different wars and battles up until I think 1978 is when it reached capacity. So two things that make this battle um, in 1876 so interesting are, uh, you know, first of all, you've got Custer, who's like a, a war hero from the Confederate Army and had all kinds of like, I don't know, you might call them lucky stints, where I think he had a horse shot out from under him 11 times and, and st was still walking around and leading battles. And then you had these Indian tribes led by Sitting Bull who, who wanted to embrace the traditional nomadic way of life that they were used to instead of being stuck on reservations uh, like the United States had told them they needed to be. You know, there have been battles going on for years. And so this is that climactic time where the Indians take a stand against not just Custer and the 7th Cavalry, but against what the United States wants them to do as far as the reservations and everything. You can take a drive of the, a tour set up and you're going to stop and you're going to see kind of what led up to the battle and spots of interest. And this is the first stop. And this is the Indian encampment. This is on the day of the battle in 1876. This is where around 7,000 Indians were camped right in this area. So this is pretty cool. At all these stops, they've got these paintings that you can look up and see exactly what it's talking about. So from over here, which would be considered the crow's nest, is where Custer could look down. You can see the encampment of all the Indians in this area over here. So the initial thoughts were there were around, you know, 700, 800 uh, warriors that were with the Indians, and Custer's infantry had, I don't know, maybe six, 700. There ended up being 
close to 2,000 warriors down here instead of 800. So when Custer saw the Indian forces and he thought he'd been discovered, he opted to split up his troops and he sent Reno around on the other side of the Bighorn River, not quite to where that train's at in the background, while Custer went this way uh, and they were supposed to meet up, but that isn't what happened. Reno and his troops went down, uh, they were confronted by Indians and they were pushed back. And so Reno retreated back over here instead of going the way he was supposed to go to be able to meet up with Custer, which left Custer and his men fending for themselves in this direction. So Custer took his 600 troops, split them into four different battalions. He had about 225 out of the 600 with him. And they came to this, what they call the Medicine Tail Ford, and uh, started the march toward what looked like where all the Indians were staying. So there was a brief skirmish with the Indians over here by the river. And they retreated from the river up toward this valley right over here. And so the Indian warriors continued to pursue Custer and his men. And they laid on this ridge right here and basically just continued to fire on Custer. There were several reasons that Custer was defeated, but I know one of them was how well that the Indians knew the land, knew how to use the land, and they engaged Custer's men in a way that Custer was not used to. Uh, the United States Army would just line up and sequentially fire and everything was organized. They even had certain men in the back holding the horses and all that. Uh, you know, with the Indians, it's nothing like that. Every man for himself, pretty much chaos, which is not what the U.S. Army was used to. And so they're circling around and, you know, the way that the United States Army fought just did not work as well in this kind of terrain with what the way that the Indians fought. So something really unique to this battlefield is they placed markers where soldiers had fallen. They, they buried them where they found them. It kind of gives a different perspective. It, it's very personal that way. And it also shows the progression of how the battle took place. So it's very accurate and it's almost like you can see the story unfold. For historians, it really gave them a better look at the battle and how things, how things happened and how they fell because it was very accurate. So this is Calhoun Hill. This is where a lot of Custer's troops, some of them got spread around this way and then some were coming around this way. But they, uh, for a short time, tried to meet up here and make a stand here. But they got chased off of here and then went toward what's known as Custer's Last Stand. And so this is the last stand hill. This is where everything came to a climactic close. A lot of people estimate the time that Custer's part of the battle took place was less than an hour. So this wasn't like a, you know, possibly not even an hours long battle. It was very short. Of course, all of Custer's men were wiped out, around 225, versus uh, 60 to 100 Indians is kind of what they estimate. So there were around 41 of Custer's men found on Last Stand Hill, including Custer, and I think one of his brothers was close to here. Uh, they shot their horses, they dug in, and then I think it was over pretty quick. all these markers we've shown all over the battlefield that is originally where um, the soldiers were buried is where they they died they just hastily buried everybody and put a marker up uh, but then in like 1877 they went back and exhumed everybody and put most of them about 220 are in this memorial right here behind me and then some of the officers including Custer and some of the others were moved to like eastern cemeteries Custer was in the um, New York right West Point I think so they moved his body so they found the bones of 39 horses in about a 30 foot diameter around this hill that Custer and his men had shot and were used to hide behind um, at the end of the battle. You just, you know when it gets to that point where you're shooting your horses to hide behind them, um, it's gotten bad. Because they had high ground at a point where they could be totally surrounded, um, they had, you know, people coming from this direction and that direction on the other side of the hill, just everywhere around them, Indians were coming up and attacking. So it didn't necessarily help that much to have the high ground in that instance. For two Cheyenne warriors fell. And this is the Indian Memorial over here, uh, right across from where the Last Stand Memorial is. 
there's lots of speculation on all the different things that could have went wrong for Custer um, in this battle. Uh, I mentioned the terrain and just the way they fought was different, but also even the weapons they chose. Primarily, I mean, they did have um, pistols for really close range, but for the most part, they used long range weapons that were good at about 300 yards, whereas the Indians had rifles that were good at like 200 yards or closer, and they could fire off shots faster than Custer's men. So at long range, Custer's army was in good shape. But once I got within that 200 yards, a lot of the Indians, the rifles they had were actually better than what Custer had. And they could get off, I think what I saw was like 13 shots to Custer's four in like a 30 second span. So I mean, you're talking like three to four times faster uh, as far as the amount of shots they could get off in a battle like this. I think I've been extra quiet today because history sometimes is hard to swallow and sometimes it's hard to understand. I mean, we weren't there, we don't know what was happening, but I guess I just have a hard time, you know, reliving history sometimes. It just gets me emotional. I guess I just you know, sometimes I don't understand the battles between people, um, but it's it's part of our our country's history, and people, you know, sacrificed and 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 fought for their freedom, and you know that's something to learn about and respect. But it's it's hard to swallow sometimes. We can't ride those horses. So the place we've been staying is called Two Leggings. Uh, I think it's maybe like a recreation area, something like that. When you come in, the sign says park in your designated camping area. And uh, it's pretty tough to figure that out. This might be a camping area. And that's definitely a camping area. Um, and there might be one or two camping areas on that end. But if you stay on that end, then you're dealing with kind of like the boats coming in and out, more traffic and that kind of thing. There's not a whole lot of traffic here. It's pretty quiet. It's actually really serene. Amenity-wise, there's pretty much nothing. There's a vaulted toilet down here. And that's pretty much it. It's one of my favorite things is seeing the horses come and graze on the other side. And I don't know, it's been, it's been fun getting to watch Hensley play in the water. It's just really peaceful here. Yeah, I think this whole area has been a good experience. Uh, I don't know that this is like a stay a week or two kind of area, but it's a good, you know, two or three nights. And that, that's the thing too, you can only stay here two nights is what the sun says. There's nobody around at all when we were here at least. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it's really neat that if you are doing this lifestyle and then you can show your kids mm -hmm. and firsthand, like it made so much more sense to me today getting to see it in real life than in a textbook. I mean, that was really neat, getting to relive history, getting to walk where our ancestors walked and where history of our country took place. It was just, um, it was emotional and it was humbling. It was just... Um, I mean, you literally, you're driving your car pretty close to the path of what customer's regiment was taking um, and sort of experiencing the battle as it happened. And I mean, we're, we're parked right here in front of Little Bighorn River and, you know, you really, you can feel the terrain, you can feel mm -hmm. the heat. It's been great getting to see things leading up and uh, paths people have taken and we've really got to immerse ourselves in, in the land and history and culture and it's been a really neat experience. Well, it's helped us grow too. I think the great thing about history is if you really study it and you really immerse yourself in it, it changes you as a person too, and it should. I mean, you should mm -hmm. learn from, you, you can't learn from the past until you know what the past was. Mm -hmm. We'll probably get it wrong more <laughs> than we get it right, <laughs> but we're trying, um, and I think that's what it's about. Well, uh, this is our last day here. Tomorrow will be somewhere new. Can't wait to share it with you guys. We will catch you later. It's Daddy! <laughs> <laughs>